I'm Linda Rousseau, and along with Patricia Chernoff, we're hosting tonight's event, which raises the question, is there torture in New York State prisons? Our three guest speakers will examine and shed light on this inquiry. I will briefly introduce each speaker before their talk. Later, we'll have a Q&A period, and we'll, if you like, you can write a question on a card, or we're going to turn the three seats of the speakers toward everyone, and, and you can have a, a dialogue. Okay, you can ask your question, and I think they'll be happy to respond. Um, first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Carol Nixon, who's from Riverside Church Ministry and the Social Justice Ministry for their co-sponsorship of tonight's event, as well as their generosity of the gift of this space that we're in right now. I'd also like to thank uh, rabbis for Human Rights North America, who is co-sponsoring this event along with Metro New York Religious Campaign Against Torture. <coughs> Uh, today, uh, we're acknowledging International Day of Torture Survivors and Victims of Torture. The actual day is this coming Sunday, uh, June 26. But since we're gathered together, we thought that this would be uh, the right occasion to honor the victims, the survivors and victims of torture. So I would ask everyone to kindly rise and we'll have a minute of silence. Thank you. And now for our program. Our first speaker tonight is Mary. Can you all hear me? No? You can't? Can you hear me now? Oh, oh, okay. Our, our first speaker tonight, okay? Our first speaker tonight is Mary Beth Pfeiffer, who writes for the Poughkeepsie Journal and has been an investigative reporter for 15 years and a journalist for more than 30 years. Mary Beth is author of Crazy in America, the hidden tragedy of the criminally, excuse me, crim criminalized mentally ill, which grew out of reporting on the abuses of people with mental illness in New York State prisons. Ms. Pfeiffer is a former Soros Justice Media Fellow and has won numerous awards for her work. Her articles have appeared in the New York Magazine, Boston Globe, Miami Herald, Hartford Courant, and other publications. Let's welcome, let's welcome Mary Beth. Thanks, Linda. Um, it's good to be here in such a beautiful room on such a beautiful day, um, pondering a not so beautiful question, but a question that does need to be asked um, and to be considered. And I will try and speak up <laughs> uh, so that you can all hear me. Um, as Linda said, I'm an investigative reporter, and I've been doing that um, exclusively for about 15 years of a 30 plus year um, career. And um, about 11 years ago, 12 years ago or so, um, I started looking at conditions in New York State prisons. Um, it was the kind of the, the peak of the growth of the prison population um, in New York. We had seen this enormous explosion of prison space um, we'd gone from something like 40 prisons to 70 prisons um, in about a 20-year period. Um, we were keeping people far longer, and um, the conditions that we were keeping them under were um, not so good. And, um, you know, I first started looking at things like um, 
trends in parole and what kind of programs we were offering to people. You know, were we educating them? Were they leaving prison any better than when they went in? And one thing sort of led to another. And the more I looked, the more problems I found. Um, there were problems in people securing parole. Um, there were um, not enough opportunities for them when they left prison. There wasn't enough drug treatment. There wasn't enough um, rehabilitation programs in general. And then one day, I got a, um, a list of, uh, actually a database. I work a lot with computer programs, and I crunch data. And, and um, I got a database of deaths in prisons. And it listed four um, causes of death, natural, homicide, um, AIDS at that time, and suicide. And the suicide death sort of piqued my interest. You know, why were people killing themselves in prison? It may seem like a, an obvious reason because they're in prison and they're unhappy and their lives are derailed. But I wanted to learn more about that. So I began to collect documents and, and data and do interviews and so forth. And I really um, came to, to see that um, suicide really is, is one of the key ways that you can judge what's going on in our prisons today. And what I found happening in our prisons was that people who were committing suicide were doing it within many times these very small, um, closet-like cells um, called solitary confinement or special housing units. Um, they have different names in different states, but the long and short is that it's an extremely stressful, very difficult environment to, to live in and to live in for long periods of time. And we were keeping people there for, for three, five, ten years at a clip. And the other thing I saw was that many of the people who were in these units suffered from mental illness. What I found was a very large proportion of people suffering um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. And what basically had happened over the evolution of time, the growth of prisons, the closing of mental hospitals, was that these units have become many um, mental asylums. Um, and just all sorts of awful things are happening there. Um, people self-mutilating, um, people um, deteriorating in terms of their mental health, people killing themselves. Um, then I wrote a book. I left the Poughkeepsie Journal for a few years. I looked at the situation around the country. I found much the same um, situation going on in many other states. Um, my book basically is uh, a series of profiles of people who have tangled with the criminal justice system, with, who have mental illness, and the awful results um, because we lack the resources to treat people with mental illness in the community and then certainly in prison. Anyway, just fast forward about 10 years from my, my first um, reporting on this. And last March, I wrote, I wrote this story. And it basically says, the headline is, Inmate 19 Hanged Self After Grossly Inadequate Care. Um, you know, it seems that things basically hadn't, hadn't changed much. Um, and um, in fact, in some ways, had gotten worse. Um, on the plus side, our prisons in New York are smaller than they were. We have fewer prisoners incarcerated now than in, I think, the year 2000 when we hit about 71,000 um, inmates. We're now down to about 55,000. That's, that's the really good news. <laughs> um, the not so good news is that as the population has declined, we have more people in these special housing units in solitary confinement because we have them. Um, because they're considered a valuable tool of control. Um, and um, 
The other thing is that we're not seeing the average stays in these units decline at all. Um, five years ago, it was 112 days um, on average, and that doesn't count all the other stuff that they add on. That's just kind of the minimum stay, the average. Um, and it's still 112 days. Um, and the other bad news <laughs> is that um, suicides are rising in our prisons. Um, last year, we had 20 suicides in New York State prisons. Um, it was the highest rate in 28 years. Um, the prison um, officials like to say, when I ask them questions, why were there so many last year? They like to say, well, it always goes up and down. And if you look at, you know, 19 or 2007, I think we hit 18. In 2005, we also hit 18. But I do these kind of, you know, big um, kind of looks, big bites at the database. And, and, you know, basically what I saw from the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s was the prison suicide rate going up. In the 2000s, it went up 23%. Um, the way I, I find out about <coughs> um, the cases I write about primarily is through um, reports that I get from the New York State Commission of Correction. Um, which is a state uh, agency entity. Um, its members are appointed by the governor, and it looks at um, prison suicides. Uh, it investigates them. It tries to figure out what went wrong and to get the powers that be to fix the problems that it finds. And um, <clears throat> I just want to show you one or two of these to get you, give you a sense of what they look like when I get them. Um, it, it's very interesting trying to figure out as a reporter, they're just always throwing roadblocks in front of you um, as you try and figure out what the heck went on. But believe it or not, you usually can. There's lots of stuff cut out and they say it's, you know, because they want to protect the inmate's confidentiality and privacy and, and his rights, you know, to keep secrets that he might want to keep or she. But um, usually it serves to, <laughs> you know, um, to help the bureaucracy keep things under wraps. But nonetheless, uh, you know, you can figure out because there are conclusions drawn um, and um, there are recommendations made. And this particular um, case is, is the 19-year-old um, who um, committed suicide at Downstate Prison, which is in um, Dutchess County. So for us, this was a local case, which I always like because there's much more interest in it. Um, but I'll just read you one sentence, one or two sentences from the findings in this report. Um, and Adam Wheeler, just by background, was, was um, 16 years old when he committed his crime, which was to have sex with a 10-year-old. Um, who he knew, it was a family friend, not that that makes it better, but I do question the, I think, three to seven year sentence that he received and the fact that he went to a state prison at all for doing something when he was 16 years old. We have a lot of that. Um, Wheeler received grossly inadequate mental health evaluation, treatment, and case management characterized by a nearly complete breakdown in continuity of care between two success successive incarcerations from August two seven, uh, 2007 to October 2009 and February 2010 to March 2010, in which his mental health status seriously d diminished, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you read this sort of um, finding often in these reports. That's particularly strong, but, but not at the ordinary in terms of inadequate care, um, gross inadequacies, not enough staff. And then the commission comes along and it says, you have to do this, you have to do that. And in this particular case, one of the things they said is um, he wasn't basically um, uh, um, diagnosed well enough or, or um, identified as being someone who was potentially suicidal by a particular psychologist. And what they said was, we want you to go back and look at all the other cases that this psychologist handled because, you know, maybe they are in the same boat. And the response by the Office of Mental Health was we don't have to do that because that psychologist doesn't work here anymore. 
Um, and there's other cases, there's other uh, examples of that sort of thing where the bureaucracy says, um, we don't think we really need to do that, so we're not going to do that. Um, basically, the Commission of Correction doesn't have much um, authority to enforce um, these recommendations uh, that it gives. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the question that we're looking at today, and I'm going to wrap up in a minute or two uh, and let Jack go, um, is this torture? Um, I would ask a much broader question, um, and I guess it, it would be more along the lines of, um, is it moral um, to punish people the way that we do in America today? Um, and all the things that that leads to. Is it moral that we have two million people behind bars? That we have the highest incarceration rate of any industrialized nation on earth? Um, that that really doesn't seem to be changing very much, um, even though we have the awareness that it should. Um, is it moral that there's so many drug offenders in prison? That there's so many people of color in prison? Um, that we don't provide the care that, that people need once they get there in terms of mental health care. We don't rehabilitate them. They don't leave prison any better than when they went in. Um, I think we need to be a much more um, forgiving and tolerant society. Um, and I think uh, prisons would be a good place to start. So with that, I'll turn it back. Thank you, Mary Beth. And now our second speaker, Jack. Mary Beth Pfeiffer, excuse me. Our second speaker, Jack Beck, has been the director of the Prison Visiting Project at the Correctional Association of New York. The Correctional Association has statutory authority to inspect prisons in New York State and to report findings to the legislature and public. Mr. Beck will give us an overview of how solitary confinement is used in New York prisons, as well as the administrative and legislative restrictions placed on its use. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. It's really my pleasure to come here and talk to folks you know, about this issue. Um, and what's particularly inspiring is when it's a group of people that we don't have to start with the basic question of the dignity of the individuals involved. Sometimes we're really starting from a point of where people don't really want to acknowledge that very basic dignity. I think that's an assumption of the people that are supporting this and that's wonderful to have that as a premise. I'm going to try to tell a story that involves several components. A story about pain and suffering um, that definitely exists a story about citizen activism and mobilization to actually try to improve conditions. The government's response um, measured and sometimes ineffective to that. Um, a story of some success, but most importantly a story that recognizes the humanity of the individuals and how important it is that people stay engaged in trying to advocate for them. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about uh, continuing with Mary Beth's line about the mentally ill that are incarcerated. Uh, we have basically gone through a process in the United States where we close the hospitals, the mental health hospitals, and then for poor people of color, we put them in prison instead. The reason for that is that when the closing of the hospitals, it was intended to have community-based care and they never instituted community-based care. And so you took a bunch of people who were vulnerable, who needed services, and you never provided those services. And lo and behold, now you have people that we ride the subways, you see it on the street. There are people that no one wants to care for. And so what do we do? A lot of what we do in the United States, we criminalize aberrant behavior and we lock people up because what it's locking up, locking up is taking away the problem from the public view. It is. Uh, inhumane, it is cruel, and I believe it actually is torture. Um, inside the prisons, 
So now we're taking this population that in New York State represents maybe 13, 14 percent of the population are actually on the Office of Mental Health caseload. But many people believe 30, 40, maybe even a majority of the people inside prison actually have some mental health needs. It's an extraordinarily high number. What we do inside prison, we then put them in an environment for people who have mental health problems, and what do we say? We're going to impose very rigid rules that are very hard to comply with. We're going to give you no support mechanism, and then if you violate any of those rules, we're going to lock you up in an environment that's going to make your mental health status worse. Now, to me, that is torture. What is torture? It's knowing that you're going to cause pain and discomfort. It's inevitable that that's going to happen. And it does happen. Let me give you just one example. I was at Attica, one of the very famous prisons, and I went into the disciplinary unit on that, uh, in that facility. And they had started a program, which I'm going to talk about, where they actually were finally starting to give some mental health services. And I met this man. He was locked up in this little cage to get therapy. And he said, He's been in disciplinary confinement for 10 years. He had gone to a mental health hospital 20 times while he was incarcerated to just be returned again into the prison. He had scars up and down both of his arms and across his face where he had self-mutilated and tried to harm himself many times. And that during this whole time period, he had not been to a residential mental health treatment unit inside of the prison for eight years. This was the first time they were trying to give him therapy, and his notion was he was very appreciative, but literally while he was in that program, he tried to harm himself again. This is the definition of failure. In some respects, I define corrections, what their policies are insane. And what is insanity? When you're doing the same thing over and over, and you expect a different outcome. Because corrections has basically one hammer. Their hammer is, if you violate the rules, we are going to discipline and lock you up. And for so many people, that is not an effective remedy. It doesn't change behavior, it actually exacerbates behavior and leads to more misbehavior. And they keep on doing it, so much so that there are people who have disciplinary sentences that go many years beyond their actual sentence inside prison. In other words, there's no deterrence, there's no effect. In fact, what it does is lead to more misbehavior and aberrant behavior. So let's run a few numbers in some of the systems. Just to talk about it, in uh, 1970, New York locked up 12,000 individuals, 12.5. We reached a peak of 71,500 at the end of 1999, and now we've dropped back to 56,000, a little under. Um, that's a dramatic change. But kind of interesting, during almost that whole time, we had a psychiatric hospital that had 189 beds when we started out in the, in the 80s, and just recently went up to 200. Namely, we had a tripling of the population and no change in the psychiatric beds. The number of people on the OMH caseload, and I don't want to overemphasize numbers, but look at, there are at a peak of about a Two years ago, they had 9,000 inmates on the OMH caseload. But they only have about a little over 1,000 residential mental health beds. So 8,000 people, many of them, many thousands of them have severe mental illness, are just out in the prison population receiving no care. Well, it's inevitable that those individuals are going to have problems in that population when you're not receiving any care. So inside the prison, disciplinary confinement becomes the dumping ground for people with mental illness. And so remember the numbers I said about 14 percent of people in the entire prison are on the OMH caseload. In many of the disciplinary confinement units, half the people are on the mental health caseload. And many of them have very severe mental illness. Literally we would walk these units in, not to be too graphic, there would be feces on the wall, there'd be people howling all into the night. There are people that are not bathing and taking care of themselves. But I go to these units, my job is to actually go to the prisons and inspect them. And the most telling thing about these units is that when you walk them, the sensory deprivation that goes on. People, what are they doing? They're in their beds with the covers over their head, just sleeping. Because they have nothing to do, they have no engagement, 
And these are not individuals that are necessarily the readers that occupy themselves with that medium. They are just alone and lost. Many of them therefore hurt themselves or they have decompensation. Again, this is torture, I think, in any fair definition. But there's another side to this, and I want to talk about some of the positives. A group of people, who, some of who are here, um, really realize that this is a tragedy and we have to do something about it. So several things happen. One, there was a coalition that was formed, Mental Health Alternatives to Solitary Confinement, MAHASC. There's a bunch of materials over on the table. The group is still going for it's almost about eight to nine years. I think it's been in effect. And what was so inspiring about it, it brought together several different groups. It brought together lawyers, it brought together prison advocates, it brought together mental health advocates, and mo I think most importantly, it brought together family members of people incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. This was a coalition of individuals that said, we've had enough, we have to do something about it. Another important piece, I call this the perfect storm, is that several legal service organizations, calling the Legal Aid Society and Prison Legal Services and others, filed a lawsuit about what was going on. And then a group like mine, I work for a place called the Correctional Association, we decided to write a series of reports about what was happening. The net result of that is that the litigation, after several years, had a settlement in 2007 that started to make some change. It required that there at least be two hours of therapy for people in disciplinary confinement who have serious mental illness. It expanded some of the caseload. It did a number of other things. It's complicated, 17 pages long. I can't describe it all, but there was progress. But kind of most importantly is that the advocacy group did say, oh, we're not satisfied. We want to change the law because litigation changes things temporarily. Laws change them permanently. And so we pushed for a bill called the SHU Exclusion Law. What that said is that individuals with serious mental illness can no longer be put in disciplinary confinement. They have to be transferred to a residential mental health treatment unit in the prison. The Department of Correctional Services, OMH, said no way, we're not going to do that. They went to the governor, they fought it, but because of the activism of the citizens groups, press, 13 different um, press around the state had editorial supporting it, we had the law passed, and the governor, over their objection, signed the law. That has had some positive impact. What has happened is they have now created a unit under the law that now will give four hours a day of mental health services for some people with a serious mental illness. There are another, a number of other steps that will realize some improvement. But I have to say some improvement. Because the other message here is there's still a fundamental problem of people recognizing the dignity of these, these individuals and that they need care. So since that law was passed, first of all, that law said that they have until, guess what, next week, July 1st, a little over a week, July 1st, 2011, is when they have to fully implement that law. And it was originally passed in 2008. They said, we need a lot of time to kind of implement this law. And they started to do some changes. But in 2009, they went to the legislature and they tried to change the law. And again, the advocates had to get involved, fight them in the legislature, and they didn't change it. Then just two weeks ago, <laughs> just before the law was going into effect, they came back again to us and said, you need some changes, it's gonna to cost too much money, we can't do all this, and they're trying to fight it again. In prisons, the one thing about prisons is that this is a group that has no power, that is very costly, and no one really cares about them in terms of the mass public. And so it needs more than other groups, advocates on the outside, to keep on pushing back. Because when budget cuts come, when there is limited resources, they are the first group that are gonna suffer. And then inside the prison, groups that really need intensive needs, like mental health or medical care. Those are the ones that they wanna cut back even more. So what we are saying is, this is a time to stay vigilant. This is a time for all of us to be very engaged in what is happening. Make not only sure that the law happens, but that it's implemented. Because there's, what I would say about prisons, the fundamental piece is that prisons are closed institutions that are intentionally closed so that the public doesn't know what's going on because they don't want to know what's going on. Therefore, those that do care about that have a couple of obligations. One, we have to make transparent what is happening inside. 
And two, we have to hold people accountable for the consequences. That's why Mary Beth is so important in her work. She's holding them accountable for the consequence of what's going on. Suicide doubled from 10 two previous years to 20. No one knew about that until we started making that public. It was hidden. We have been talking about, and some people here have been talking about, in many different forums, the pain and suffering that their family members and others have gone through because of their incarceration. We have to be vigilant because they cannot be advocates for themselves and the public want to keep them removed. So, what can be done? One is, it's very important to be engaged. We have this coalition, Mahask, um, that one can get involved in if you want to. Under the law, we had another very important piece. That law requires that another state agency called the Commission on Quality of Care that looks at nursing homes and others, the law required that they look at what's going inside the prisons to see if they're actually complying with the law. And we have to say, uh, I'm going to say from my own personal opinion, that this group, which we call CQC, it's a state agency, but they have been much more active than many other state agencies that I have seen that have some oversight responsibility. And so what they've done is, which is truly extraordinary, is they are want to know from the public what's happening. So another flyer we have there is they're actually seeking surveys from family members who have incarcerated people with mental illness to find out what those experiences are. So if you or a family member of someone inside, please pick it up. But more importantly, if you work for an agency or you know other people that might have some information about what's happening inside, please pick up that flyer and give that to them because they are seeking to have people fill out this survey and it's going to go on until the middle of July. So there's something to be done. And finally, I'd ask that you stay vigilant about some of the legislation and other things that are happening about people inside. I could have come up here and talked about many other forms of torture. There is violence against inmates inside. People are being brutalized by staff and sometimes other inmates. There is sexual violence inside the prisons. That happens to women and to men. In fact, uh, there's a Prison Rape Elimination Act that has coming up with new guidelines that hopefully will be implemented that will require greater reporting, but they have been looking at it and just some of New York prisons had the highest rates of other prisons around the country. There is many other forms of torture that I believe goes on when you don't meet the fundamental needs of individuals. But most importantly, we have to fight the basic premise that people inside prison are inmates rather than people. And until you recognize their dignity, we're never really going to see a change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Beck. Our next speaker is James Benjamin. James is with the Riverside Church Prison Ministry Program, and he's going to give testimony about his experience in the New York State prison system. Mr. Benjamin will discuss torture that has its beginnings in the Attica protests back in 1971. And he's what, he was one of the moral compasses at Attica during the protests. He saved lives, but today he's still tortured for his involvement. I give you James. Thanks for the invitation. Can you hear me? Not too well. Can you hear me? Thanks for the invitation. Great. I want to have, a, <coughs> excuse me, I want to have a conversation with you. I don't really have any speech to make. The conversation <coughs> I, was, I was told to talk about my personal experiences. I don't have, uh, you know, about my personal experiences. I'm not an investigative reporter, nor am I a lawyer. I just, I only know about what I know, what happened to me. This conversation I'd like to have with you has two aims. One aim is for your enlightenment. The other aim is for all of us to connect the dots to analyze the torture that I'm continuing to go through. I'm talking about torture that denies equality, 
torture that denies wholesomeness, uh, torture that deprives me of my humanness. I'm talking about torture that's evil, insidious, and very, very clever. The things I, my vision, the things I experience, uh, perhaps you can get a better feel for them if I first introduce myself. You've already been told my name is Benjamin James Benjamin. I, some, in the, in, during the 30 years that I've been in prison, some um, call me doctor. Um, in Greenhaven Prison, <clears throat> I had the privilege of uh, working for Marist College and uh, bringing students, undergraduate students, up to academic standards. For example, the, the late Reverend Dr. Lonnie McLeod, who was a voice here in the Riverside Prison Ministry, I'm proud to say that uh, with my help, he passed his calculus and statistics courses. Also, Eddie Ellis, who now uh, hosts a radio show, uh, with my help, he passed his calculus and statistics courses. And the list goes on. Uh, in, in Sing Sing Prison, a deputy superintendent of programs uh, commended me. He, 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 he uh, advised some of the people aspiring to get their high school diplomas to see me, to come to my groups, because it seemed to him that I was able to do things that his staff could not do. And he noticed that because not only were these people earning their high school diplomas, but they were earning them with higher marks than were, than were usual, than were, than were usual. Uh, I also, uh, at Sing Sing Prison, I, in, a, in addition to, uh, I taught some of the, something a little more abstract. I taught, for lack of a better word, I taught socialization. Uh, a partner, uh, a, a partner of mine, who's now a case manager at the Fortune Society. He and I had filled a 500-seat auditorium with all of the gangs. All of the gangs, we filled the auditorium with them. And we taught responsibility. We didn't, we, we let them do what gangs do, what gangs want to do. They want to create, not be destructive. And what they did, uh, they paid admission watched a movie and we a film and we uh, donated the proceeds from their paying to watch the film to the United Negro College Fund. We, uh, our intention were to educate the lawyers, the judges, and the politicians of tomorrow so that we could end mass incarceration then. That was our intention back in 1995. I also taught thinking critically, some sort of Socratic thing that I don't want to bore you with, some sort of, acad some sort of acad abstract academic stuff, but Socrates was about asking questions. And when you got enough information, then he said uh, you, you could do something, you could exercise your free choice of the will, is what makes us human, which, make, which is what God gives us, free choice of the will. We don't want to hear this thing about, oh, you know right from wrong. No, let me think first. Let me make my own choices and decisions based on information. And I taught this. I was sent to, to the special housing unit, the box, for 36 months for doing that, by the way. The uh, correction officers union says, oh, no, we can't have these guys doing that. Violence was down and things, violence was down. And he says, no, the, the officers say, oh, no, 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 we're not going to have that. So they carted me off upstate to the North Country. My second trip to the North Country, my first trip was years ago, 1971. Uh, during the first moments of the Attica protest, I was, um, oh, I guess I was in intuitive enough to me and some other uh, Muslims who call themselves five percenters, 
we harness the the energy of predators. We, we, we harness that energy and we put this, we put the resources, scarce resources, in the center of D Block Yard. We stopped interpersonal violence between officers and inmates. We stopped interpersonal violence, we stopped officers from being hurt, from murdered, and we stopped all interpersonal violence between inmates. Attica is the only prison riot ever where there was no, I think he, the lawyer talked about sexual assaults, and none of that was at Attica, it didn't happen. We also uh, had uh, other little things that people had. We had a sewage system. The state turned off the water, but we, uh, our vision was so that we knew that we had to, uh, we, we had to re relieve ourselves. And in the dark, it was all in one yard. In the dark, if you don't have a place to, to relieve yourself, then you might have to lay down and, and, and get somebody's defecation all over you. So at the beginning of the riot, we saw, per protest, I should say, we saw the need for, for doing things like this. I think that the uh, Attica protests uh, parallels the Paris Commune and the American Revolution. That's what I think. Uh, I'd like to get to the, the, the points uh, that I think are necessary for analyzing my experience with torture. The first point is Michelle Alexander's quoting James Baldwin. They say torturers destroy hundreds and thousands of lives and torturers do not know it, nor do torturers want to know it. That's what she says. And uh, I, maybe she, I guess she's right. I feel she's right. It has a sound of truth to me. It has a sound of correctness to me. Uh, I, 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 and, I, and, and this is important because the torture has come outside the prison industrial complex and is now in here in the society at large. It's leaped the wall. It's, it's out here. I'm being tortured. I've been, and I've been out of prison now nine, four months. Five, four or five months. I've been out of prison five months now, and I'm being tortured. I feel it. I'm not talking about the kind of torture that we started off, we, Western culture started off doing. We drove spikes into people's hands and feet. I'm not talking about that kind of torture. I'm talking about torture that drives a spike into my mind, into my will to create. That's what I, that's torture. That's real torture into my spirit to create. <laughs> I, uh, apparently, I tell you about, I taught, I teach things, I have taught things. You know, I've done impossible. I got 500 different gang members in one room and there was no problem with them. So evidently, I know something about something. I'm here to create. <laughs> no, not, not here, not today, not in this society. So I'm being tortured. We are losing, we are not, uh, uh, we're not using our resources. Yeah, we're going to be far behind the rest of the world because we we have uh, we have things that we're not even beginning or trying to use. This is important torture coming out of the prison system here into the society at large. I, I remember James Baldwin once said that. Uh, and he was taking off from the Holocaust. He says, if they come for me in the morning, they're coming for you at night. Remember that. So the torture that comes out of the prisons, so let's stop it. Let's do something about it now. I, I really don't know what to do, but Edmund Burke says, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. Let's, so let's get with it, please. The second point I'd like to make is that Michelle Alexander, in paraphrasing Michelle Alexander, she says that the torturers see worthless human beings when they meet face to face with the formerly incarcerated, the presently incarcerated, and those about to stumble in the prison. That's, that's Michelle Alexander. So maybe one thing we might do to stop this, we might start to put a human face 
on, on, on prisoners. If we put a human face, maybe we have less crime, maybe people have shorter sentences, people, in, people have been languishing 30, 40 years because they ain't human. Well, if we get a human face on them, maybe, maybe they'll let them out. And maybe people who get out, if they're human, they won't, have, they won't still be tortured. The third point, Michelle Alexander, in, in, in the third dot rather in analyzing my experience in torture, Michelle Alexander, referencing James Baldwin, allows me to survive torture for my preeminent and noble conduct. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a, I mean, what can I, what, what kind of commentary am I making on our, in our, on our society that I am tortured for preeminent and noble conduct? What am I saying? What are we saying about ourselves? Heaven, I mean, I, I mean, what can you do after you, uh, I mean, what can you do? You, 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 you stumble in the, I stumbled in the prison as a youth. I thought that I was uh, changing property relations. I says, give me your money. <laughs> this is a sticker, give me your money. I thought I was changing, uh, I think, I, I thought I was redistributing the wealth. I had no idea that was a felony. That was a, a I had no idea. Uh, Mandela had people going to jail in South Africa. Martin Luther King had people going to jail in Alabama, Georgia, so I went to jail too. We need to start, we need to start treating our youth as people and educate them. So you don't have people like, like me uh, uh, doing, because this is the only person I can talk about is me. We don't have people like me doing something stupid like saying, like redistributing the wealth, committing a political crime, <laughs> so I thought. That's ridiculous, that's absurd. Fourth, because of Michelle Alexander's book, my surviving is, 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 really, is really illuminated. I, I mean, it's, it, it, my surviving is really lit up because of her book. There are two things that she makes me, that I adopt, I, I take the words right out of her mouth and put them into my mouth and let them come out of my mouth because now they are my words. I will not make peace with mediocrity. I will not make peace with mediocrity. I will continue striving for excellence. Those are my words now, I stole them from her. I guess the second point is that there's hidden evidence. We're coming to Attica 40 years later. There's hidden evidence, evidence hidden in, in the archives at CBS, ABC, and NBC. Hidden evidence there, as well as my own personal testimony, of why that protest was such an orderly, such a well, well-organized thing. Well, let's sort of imitate, let's sort of take off from that organization. Don't hide that away. Every year for 39 years we've been talking about how brutal the cops were. Come on, let's stop it. Let's go someplace positive. I mean, my attitude is that things are good, better, or best. Or things can be. If they are good, let's try to make them better. And let's strive for the best. I think that's a paraphrase of Michelle Alexander. I'm gonna, I'm gonna continue striving for excellence. So let's not keep redoing the things, redoing, 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 redoing. Let's sort of like move forward. Once the water's under the bridge, let it go. Don't, don't be foolish and try to hold it back. That's, that's sheer stupidity. Anyway, enlightened, meeting at a civic organization and the organization was meeting on the premises of the correction association I had to walk out pull the spike out so I can start to heal let's stop that let's stop that finally I, I got a handout over here uh, it's, it's not a paper I wrote because it's not it's, it's not to a professor, 
or to a doctor in a college course. But I had all the professors I've ever met, every course I've ever taken, I had them in mind when I wrote it. I have a paper over there, an essay over there, and it's a handout. Before we begin the Q&A, I would hope that you would get the handout. Uh, the handout accompanies, is accompanied by a letter from <clears throat> a clerk in the United States District Court. Those of us who know anything about American history, uh, our American history starts at the Magna Carta. At the Magna Carta, at running something or other, the, the, the British, the English nobleman said, the king will not throw us in a dungeon without the right of habeas corpus. You will never stop the right of habeas corpus. And it's in the Constitution. Mr. Beck knows, he's a lawyer. It's right there in the Constitution. It's called the suspension clause. Well, <clears throat> in that essay, I mentioned that there are, there's a civil rights, uh, 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 a civil rights docket number, Jim Crow Jr. is the defendant filed in the summer of 2010. Jim Crow Jr. is the defendant. And the, 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 and which, and the, and, the, and the letter from the clerk says that I should be, there are four, there are four federal courts in New York. The letter from the clerk is in the, from the Southern District. He says, no, you belong in the Northern District. The Northern District is where you, where you should write this, where you should file your papers. The Northern District says, no, you're not human. You're not human. We are, we're not trying to do anything about mass incarceration. And they ignore the Constitution that says, keep the, keep the, the habeas corpus always stays alive. They, they ignore that. It's, it's right there in the, I, I, it's docketed. All you got to do is Google it. <laughs> I give you the numbers. Just Google it. You'll get it. And uh, I give you that. I mean, I, I wrote the essay or the paper or whatever it is that you want to call it, handout. I wrote it <coughs> with, I wrote it uh, with, the, with, the, with, if, with the ordinary everyday person in mind. But I hope there's someone in this room, or someone in this room knows someone, who has advanced degree and training in jurisprudence, philosophy, and ethics, that they will read it and they says, no, this is not happening in America. It can't be, it's not happening. Uh, I could go on and on and on, but they told me uh, I don't have that much time. And I'd like to hear q and A. I'd like to hear q and A because uh, I think at that point there's, you know, see my, my empathetic analysis could be wrong. Of course they say in law books, Mr. Beck may tell you that the convicts, prisoners, are just are incapable of empathy. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, incapable of empathy, yeah. But in my empathetic analysis, maybe I apologize if I'm wrong. But I think this, I think that standing in your shoes, looking at things from your eyes, through your glasses, I think that something is, something is amiss. I, I think that we should take a good look at what Edmund Burke said about evil triumphing if, we, if good people do nothing. Thanks for your time.